Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. You are now live with Recover, Reconstruct and Rebound, Budget 2022, my wish list. The biggest seminar of all time hosted by the Institute of Chartered Professional Managers of Sri Lanka. So I welcome everyone on board. And also the national budget for the fiscal year 2022 will be presented to the parliament this November. Keeping that in mind, we, CPM Sri Lanka, has invited leading people from five major areas such as exports, tourism, education, apparels, and agriculture to express their wish list as in expectation for the budget 2022. Today, these specialists will outline what their particular sector would need. This is to strengthen the sector and stimulate it to overcome the economic and financial difficulties they face. They will discuss proposals based firmly on ground reality. So um, I'm moving into the introduction of uh, the profiles. So let me begin with, we have um, five eminent speakers and of course, Mr. Nista Kasim, the uh, all round great uh, moderator uh, with us. And I will start with a very long introduction for the second time in my life. I'm reading this. This is about Mr. Suresh Dimel, Chairman and Chief Executive, Sri Lanka Export Development Board. Mr. Dimel had his primary and secondary education at St. Thomas College, Mount Lavinia, Sri Lanka. He holds a Bachelor of Science degree in Agricultural Engineering from Cal Poly, California, Polytechnic State University, San Luis, Obispo, California, and worked for 10 years as an agricultural and environmental engineer in the USA. He returned to Sri Lanka in 1990 and invested in Tangal, a post-conflict area at that time to employ unemployed young women and earn foreign exchange to the country. His company manufactured designer fishing flies, handcrafted artificial spot fishing baits for export to niche market in the US and into the world. Lanka Fishing Flies Private Limited, the pioneering export industry, was started by his father, Mr. J. Nihal Dimel, a mechanical engineer and industrialist, together with Dennis J. Blacker, a legendary American flightier and businessman in 1981, as a cottage industry um, in their home in Nugegoda. Today, the company employs 200 women in Nugegoda, Tangor, and Ratnapura and celebrate producing the world's best quality Umpakwa brand fishing fleets for 40 years. He also, uh, he's also the chairman and CEO of Sport Fishing Lanka, a responsible tourism catch and release sport fishing operations and, the, and chairman of EcoWave GTE Limited and EcoWave Travels, which are social enterprise working with 300 smallholders, spice and health farmers in the Monragala, Badulla, Kendi, Matale, and Ampar districts, promoting sustainable organic agriculture and responsible eco agrotourism. He is also the group director of Citrus Leisure PLC, which operates three star class hotel in Sri Lanka. We welcome you, sir, to the forum. And uh, Nista, I think um, you can straight away uh, point your questions at him. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Akshan. Uh, uh, welcome, Suresh, because I know you have time to uh, only limited time. Uh, can I? Can we know what are your, what is uh, any specific recommendations you have made uh, to the Honorable Finance Minister Basil Rajapaksa, and uh, what can the export community expect in terms of policy and uh, support next year? Thank you, Nista. Thank you, Hashan. And uh, thank you, CPM, for inviting me for this valuable uh, uh, webinar. Uh, first of all, I'd like to give a little bit of background on how we came about what we uh, expect or how we developed our wish list for exports. Now, something that is uh, rarely talked about is uh, the supply and demand of product when it comes to exports. Now, if you ask 
many exporters today, they will tell you that we have the number one issue is capacity. I have still to find an exporter who has told me that he has enough product or he has, he has more product than he can sell or that he has enough production capacity. Now, the two big issues here is that we do have product, but it's not exportable quality. Now, in order to make exportable value, uh, I mean, in order to create value in the export market, we, we, we have to add, add value. Now, Sri Lanka isn't a big production uh, powerhouse. So we have to look at not only expanding our product basket and expanding markets, but we have to look at adding value and looking for niche markets. So developing the value chain and the supply chain is critical if we are to develop exports going forward. So with that background, one of the most important uh, initiatives uh, that has been introduced by Honorable Bandula Gunawadana, who uh, Minister of Trade, who introduced the concept of export processing villages. Now these export processing villages, at the moment we have five products that are being developed in 80 villages and it's coffee, kitul, vanilla and TJC mango. And the fifth one is an industrial product, which is paper baskets with recycled paper. Now, this type of concept is very valuable because when we have these export processing villages, we have connected them with exporters who are already exporting the product. So what they are doing is developing the supply chain. Okay. So now we are also introducing a new concept called export houses. That is a responsible intermediary between these exporters and the supply chain. So that we create a responsible intermediary that will take care of the supply chain, right? So incentivizing these export houses and export processing villagers to produce the required quality for the export market is critical. And that is something we are looking for through the, this budget. Probably the most important wish list of all is to develop our, uh, most of it will be agro-based products and then uh, also other industrial products that we can add value in. Now, uh, again, I want to highlight the importance of adding value for niche markets. And, and in Sri Lanka, we, produce primary products. Most of our exports of agricultural products go as primary products. Now we have the best tea in the world, the best cinnamon in the world, the best black pepper in the world, but majority of it is going in bulk. Yeah. And they are going to, now cinnamon goes to a Mexican market. Black pepper goes to the Indian market. Why aren't we adding value to the world's best cinnamon and world's best black pepper and sending it to Europe and US and other Western, play, Western countries where there is a proper market, I mean a high priced value market for it. So this is where we need to promote value addition to get up in the value chain and, and uh, export to these niche markets. Now, in that respect, we are also looking for market promotion, market in promotion uh, activities through uh, the budget. Now, trade fairs were, of course, very popular, but in the last couple of years, we have not been able to do them physically because of the, the uh, pandemic situation. However, new opportunities have come up through Zoom technology, where we have much bigger bandwidth for people to participate and get exposed to uh, markets and be able to deliver the quality that is required. So for that, we have to do awareness. 
big awareness programs can happen. And for that also, it would be nice if the budget can promote this idea of online uh, development of uh, uh, promotional activity. You know, the websites and they call it social commerce today. That is e-commerce and social media. And that is something that we need to look at even cross-border for cross-border marketing. Now we all know that eBay and, and Amazon are so popular and even exporters are going through those channels. So we can develop that into a different level of producing high quality product to go out there in that respect, but awareness and developing quality for that market is very critical in order for Sri Lanka to be a uh, recognized, respectable export uh, country. Uh, currently, the, the trends uh, in pharmaceutical, pharmaceutical exports is also a possibility. It's being developed currently. We are looking for some uh, incentivizing and, and uh, uh, some background uh, through the budget for uh, pharmaceutical development. Then ICT BPM, uh, the, there is so much happening in that arena, you know, they call it intelligence of things. Uh, I mean, internet of things, uh, artificial intelligence, robotics and all kinds of uh, uh, IT products that, that we have uh, opportunity to expand and, and we have to do some skills development in that area. So skills development for that and for other uh, technology-based uh, products is critical through this uh, uh, budget. And then we have to I think one of the new opportunities that Sri Lanka has, but it's, it's funny to call it new opportunity because Sri Lanka is so famous for its spices. We have seen our spices double in, in uh, exports in the last couple of years. Now, for spice exports, again, value addition is critical. The most important way to add value would be organic agriculture. So now with our 100% chemical free policy, we can start marketing the cleanest spices in the world and then other agricultural products. So I think we need to put some effort in the value addition, especially of agricultural products. And during this, soon after the COVID and soon after this 100% chemical free thing, there's going to need the, the industry will need a lot of support to get through the first couple of years, maybe. And that is something the budget will have to consider very heavily so that we won't have the negative impact of conversion from conventional agriculture to the uh, organic agriculture. So uh, incentivizing organic fertilizer manufacture, incentivizing crop changing crop practices, incentivizing producing local seeds. All this is going to need a lot of investment uh, and, and incentivizing from the government. So those are, I think, some of the key areas, Nista, that I feel are going to be very important uh, as a wish list for exporters. Okay. Uh, thanks, Suresh. <clears throat> uh, tell us about the how far exports have done well this year so far. Uh, and I know we had a target about $12 billion for this year. Are we on course or, or what are the prospects? Yes, we are on course. And uh, we I've been personally surprised, but the exporters have been with, with lots of challenges. Uh, and most factories running below capacity because of uh, travel restrictions and social distancing and things like that. But they have somehow stepped up to the plate to deliver. And we have been doing, and I'm keeping my fingers crossed, and we are facilitating uh, uninterrupted uh, operations, even during curfew and so on, so that the the exporters will have, be able to export without any interruption 
So let's hope that that will continue. And uh, there are many challenges and I really commend my, my colleagues, uh, export community for stepping up to the plate at this time. <clears throat> Right. Uh, there is also anticipation, uh, Suresh, in terms of it will be a very tight budget uh, with little room for government to give concessions. How confident are you that export sector will be given uh, at least most of what's in your wish list? Well, um, you know, Nista, there are some things that we can do that is not going to really cost that much. One of the thing is to give some sort of a, you know, tax relief for incremental exports. That's something that has been in the cards for some time. And because that's really, you know, that's really sharing some of the extra effort that the exporters are going to put for the increased exports. So that would be really nice if we can have that kind of reward for the hard work that exporters do. So I feel like that's not going to be that costly because it's going to be sharing something that we earn additionally. So that's one thing. And another area that I feel is sort of low hanging fruit or, or um, you know, not much expense is, you know, I think the government is going to introduce uh, that uh, they are not hiring anyone for the public sector. Now, I think that that's a very significant move for the private sector because currently after the COVID, this has actually got worse. That is that there is a lot of, there are lots of graduates and, and the workforce thinks that the government is safer to work for during a crisis or the safer to work or better to work at any time. So, you see the private sector has a big labor shortage. And, and I think that this will give the private sector some labor that would otherwise be working for the government. So that I think again is not a cost, uh, that's a savings. And that might give the, agriculture, the, the, the uh, export sector, the workforce that we need for expansion and increasing exports. Okay, good. Uh, uh, I have a few more questions, but I'll take there is an immediate question to you, uh, Suresh. Um, it, it talks about uh, being able to quote in multiple currencies instead of, uh, I think, what it says, exporter wants to quote product price in US dollars. How can you get away from this myth and also make exporters to quote in several other currencies so that it brings foreign currency into the country? different from the US dollars, is, is that is there a uh, current issue in terms of only quoting through dollars? Yeah, and, and Nista, I, I, I don't believe I am qualified to discuss that because that's uh, quite confusing what is going on now. And I would like to uh, refer that to a financial person. Okay, right. <clears throat> uh, Suresh, how much time you have left for us, to, uh, for, the, for the participants? Uh, uh, yeah, I, I'll be here till about 10 to 4, okay, maybe half right. an hour, half an hour half more. Yeah. Okay, right. So, Rosh, Hashan, you want to yeah. proceed? Yeah, I'll not... proceed with the normal oh. proceedings. Okay, and just uh, before Hashan, I just have one more question to Suresh. Yeah, Suresh, I mean, this, uh, you spoke about adding value to pepper, cinnamon. I mean, we have heard this story over the years, but why isn't it happening? Why are we continuing to ship uh, tea? You name it, uh, and how how is uh, EDB tracking the increase in the value addition? Do we have a figure right now that so much is value you added exports, and you want yeah. to get to a particular percentage, higher percentage? Yes. Yes. Now, unfortunately, for organic exports, we do not have uh, data because there isn't a separate HS code at customs. And most of the data we get is from customs. So we are currently, the organic certification body is doing a study to figure out the actual value of organic uh, uh, produce being exported. That, because that's a huge value addition for our agricultural produce. On the other side, uh, you know, I think we also need uh, EDB registration or something. You know, EDB registration is not required. 
So EDB has a tough time finding the data for, for that type of information, you know. So uh, I think that is something that we have talked internally and we are trying to promote some kind of registration. Uh, you know, that EDB registration has been removed due to ease of doing business uh, situations, but it doesn't have to be like that. You know, it can be just as simple as sending whatever data into the EDB. So we are, we are trying to do some changes there. Okay, so uh, since you are here, I will uh, take some uh, questions directly addressed to you. Uh, how much, uh, in terms, this is about the usual question about imported inputs with current restrictions. Uh, how is EDB intervening in, in, in enabling uh, imports of, uh, as inputs for exports? Yeah, uh, inputs for exports, we are, you know, we have different schemes that have normally existed and, and they, they, you know, many, many companies are able to import what they want like the apparel industry and many industries can. There are some banned imports. Now those banned imports for, re -ex for export, we are getting licenses for them. And there is, you know, still a little bit of uh, uh, um, delay and, and issues because some of these banned uh, products are uh, uh, not allowed at all. And uh, so for people who want to re-export, it has become quite a challenge. But overall, the majority of uh, import inputs for exports is happening, like in the apparel industry. Okay. Uh, one maybe last question to you. Uh, it's about Gem. Uh, one, is, one was about helping uh, Sri Lankan companies to link up with Africa because there are enough uh, uh, deposits in uh, there. That's one question. The other one was about <clears throat> uh, gem and jewelry make tax free on income tax, but why not have a GI institute, institute branch under the in NG <clears throat> National Gem and Jewelry Authority affiliated soon for benchmark certification in exports? Yeah. Um... There needs to be more concerted work done on the gem and jewelry area. You know, we have a gem and jewelry authority and we have the export development board and uh, there needs to be, I, I mean, I cannot answer that question because they haven't discussed it yet, but yes, there are solutions that have to be uh, put forward for gem and jewelry because that's, that's a very valuable area for us. Okay, right. Thanks, Suresh. Thank you very much. Uh, I'll uh, take Hashan. You can take over now. Yeah. Sure. Uh, thank you, Mr. Dimel. Um, and for the viewers, he'll be here for the for the next half an hour. And four o'clock, uh, we'll be missing him from the forum. And I will take you through. Um, we are coming back on track once again. Let me introduce Mr. Suresh Dimel. He's from the export, representing the export sector, and we have representing tourism sector, Mr. Shiromal Kure. Shirumal Kure is Managing Director of Jetwin Travels Private Limited, one of the leading destination management companies in Sri Lanka. With diverse experience in a number of industries, Shirumal also holds directorates in hotels, finance, investment banking, commodity brokering, and advertising and PR agencies. Hailing from a background in finance and management, Shirumal holds an MBA from the University of Colombo, is a fellow member of the Chartered Institute of Management Accounts in the UK and, and a former finance director of J. Walter Thompson Limited, along with work experience in the UK and Hong Kong. She's past, uh, past chairman of the Sri Lanka Institute of Directors and past president of Sri Lanka Institution of Inbound Tour Operators. Shromal is a currently board uh, director of Commercial Bank PLC and Alliance Lanka. We welcome you to the forum, um, Shirama. Um, good evening to you. And good evening. Um, good evening, thank you. Okay, right, you're audible perfectly. And representing the education sector, we have the eminent Professor Lakshman R. Whatever, the President Institute of Certified Management Accountants of Sri Lanka. He's a fellow member of Institute of Chartered Accountants of Sri Lanka, Chartered Management Accountants of UK, Chartered Global Management Accountants, 
Institute of Certified Management Accountants of Sri Lanka, Chartered Professional Managers of Sri Lanka, and he is the founder of CPM as well. Past President Institute of Chartered Accountants of Sri Lanka, South Asian Federation of Accountants, Association of Management Development Institute in South Asia, Organizations of Professionals Association of Sri Lanka, OPA, and WAT Sri Lanka. A proud receiver of the National Honours Sri Lanka Sikh Harmony conferred for the distinguished service of a general nature by the President of Sri Lanka in 2019 and a fatherly figure in accounting profession who was instrumental in pioneering uh, the setting up two professional accounting bodies in Sri Lanka, Association of Accounting Technicians of Sri Lanka and the Institute of Chartered, sorry, I beg your pardon, Institute of Certified Management Accountants of Sri Lanka. Both bodies were globally recognized with the membership of the International Federation of Accountants, the global body for accounting professions. Good evening, sir. Uh, we welcome you to the forum. And um, representing um, the apparel sector, we have uh, Mr. Hasita Premaratna. Let me read out his profile. We're quite long as, as usual, with regards to the others as well. Um, Hasita, good evening to you. And um, let me read out your profile for, this, uh, for the forum to get to know you. Hasita is the group financial director of Brandis Group. He leads the overall finance function of the group and also responsible for strategy and long range planning. He's the managing director of Brandix India April City and overlooks all joint ventures and investments of Brandix Group. He is director of many subsidiaries of Brandix Group, including listed companies TJ Lanka PLC. He was formerly a director of Bank of Ceylon and was committee member and was a committee member of Ceylon Chamber of Commerce. He was a board member of SIMA Sri Lanka Division and also the Sri Lankan Accounting and Auditing Standards Monitoring Board. He was formerly the head of research at HB Stockbrokers Private Limited and possesses plenty of experience in the field of capital markets, economics, strategic finance, management, research. His lecturing experience expands for 11 years for SEMA UK, ACCA UK examinations in Sri Lanka, India, Singapore, and Philippines. Once again, good evening to you, sir. Right, representing the agricultural sector and uh, forming the wish list, uh, welcome Mr. Rizvi Saeed, Chairman, Sri Lanka Agripreneurs Forum, Chairman, Ocean Pick Private Limited, Director with Vidul Lanka PLC, Ex-Director of Haley's PLC and Managing Director Haley's Agriculture Holding Limited, Chairman, National Industry Biotechnology Association member, National Agriculture Policy Committee, member of University Grants Commission Standing Committee on Agriculture and Veterinary Science, member of University of Colombo, Faculty of Technology Council, member of Research and Technology Committee of the National Science Foundation, immediate past chairman, National Agribusiness Council, former director of Sri Lanka Institute of Nanotechnology, uh, he holds BA honors degree for the from the University of Kalania and MBA degree from the University of Colombo. Senator of JCS International. Once again, welcome to the forum, uh, Mr. Said, and we'll be hearing from you as well. And finally, last but not least, the evergreen Mr. Nista Kasi, my dear friend. It's a coincidence that uh, we both are in the same forum. Um, founding editor and chief executive officer of Daily FT, the prominent uh, newspaper of all times, where we get the current immediate financial news. My dear friend, Mr. Kasim is the founding editor and chief executive officer of the Daily FT, Sri Lanka's first and only national daily business paper since 2009. He is a senior journalist and editor with over 25 years of experience. He has worked in several newspaper brands in Sri Lanka, including The Island and Ceylon Daily News as a business journalist and The Daily Mirror where he last served as the editor before launching the Daily FT. He has traveled widely for training in journalism and marketing communication, as well as for reporting of global and regional business and economic events. He is also an executive committee member of the Editors Guild of Sri Lanka. My friend, Mr. Good evening to you. 
right? And we will proceed ahead with uh, the, uh, the, the, the discussion points. I will now hand, over, hand it over to, uh, to talk about tourism sector. Um, Shiroma Kure, over to you, madam. Uh, uh, you mean about my wishlist, right? Yeah. Correct. Yeah. Please go ahead. So, uh, so tourism, I think, has become everybody's business and everybody knows the predicament that the tourism industry is going through at the moment. Uh, the, the main issue is companies, whether you're in uh, the DMC, the destination management business or the hotel sector, or if you're a SME, uh, having vehicles that you rent out. So the cash flow is obviously an issue and the paying loans was a problem. And one of the main wish lists we had was requesting for the extension of the moratorium. So that has actually been granted uh, as of yesterday, there is a, a circular from the bank of the central bank that the moratorium for capital and interest has been extended till June, 2022. Ideally, it should be till November 2022, because that is when the high season starts and we are expecting uh, next year to be a good year and hoping that everybody in the industry, whether you're big or small or medium, will be having generating sufficient cash flow to start paying the debts. So, so the first one would be to extend the moratorium uh, till November 2022. Uh, the circular also mentioned about restructuring, that the banks are committed to restructure these loans. So that would also be a great help uh, where you can restructure for a longer period of time. The biggest wish, list, wish however, is uh, asking the government to write off the interest that has accrued during the moratorium period. Uh, it is not a selfish ask. We know, we are aware that the government also needs tax revenue. And we also aware that the banks also cannot write off because they are also working with the tax pay, uh, the depositors' money. So if the banks are responsible to uh, look after the money. But if uh, the government can give it to the banks as a tax write off so that banks also don't uh, lose out in the end, that would be the biggest wish for tourism industry. So that because if we have to add the uh, interest to the capital, that's going to be a huge task. And I would be, uh, not be wrong in saying that a lot of people are going to find it difficult to pay that because that's that's two years of uh, uh, two years in areas is, is, is quite large, whether you're a small company or a big company. And there are lots of people who are in the informal sector uh, who have taken loans because we were on a high uh, just before the pandemic. So uh, that is the biggest wish. Uh, then of course, there are so many others that we have been constantly asking, for instance, uh, that why is tourism uh, targeted with a higher uh, um, uh, tariff for electricity? Because we are also like, uh, similar to any other industry. So we should ideally be uh, given the same tariff as uh, as other industries. So that is one and that is something that we've been asking for quite a while. Uh, another thing is there is a provincial council tax that has also been uh, just given to the charge only from the tourism industry that also has been asked uh, for quite a while because other industries don't have to pay a levy. They only have to pay a trade license. So we have been requesting the government to allow the same uh, facility for tourism as well. Uh, going, uh, there is also another issue with, uh, we are very thankful to the government for allowing DMCs who earn in foreign currency to be VAT free and also hotels that use at least 60% of local produce also to go VAT free. But there's a bit of a complicated calculation here uh, because it's done on a month by month basis and hotels have to show that they've been using 60% local produce to get the uh, tax free, uh, the VAT free for the next year, next month. So, but this is becoming difficult because normally prices are given at least a year in advance. So it's not possible for them to do that. And even for a DMC, we also 
uh, contract at least uh, 12 to 18 months ahead. So it's, it's important that we have pricing for that period. So if they can look at a system that to simplify this and bring in a SWAT also to the tourism industry so that the suppliers can register on their SWAT and uh, supply to the hotels and the travel companies under a SWAT invoicing so that there is not going to be a problem. And also the calculation to be done and year in, a, in areas basically. So you take this year's uh, consumption and then you give the concession for the next year. So if something like that can be worked out, that would really help. Um, yeah, so there's a whole long list, but I don't wanna. So these are the main ones. And uh, really if the debt moratorium, the, the interest that has accrued for the last 18 to 20 months and that will accrue until next year can be written off, that would be the biggest wish. Right. Thank, um, thank you, Madam. Thanks a lot for that valuable input. We will now ask to represent the education sector, Professor Lakshman R. Watavala to address the wish list. Over to you, sir. Thank you, Haishan. Uh, maybe on uh, behalf of the chartered professional managers, I think I should welcome all our eminent uh, panelists and also our moderator. And also we have our council members who are present and all the participants who are there. And uh, I think what has been given is a very, very tall task, but I don't know whether uh, uh, this is a thing that might take days and days to speak on. But I will just speak on a few things, which is, uh, which can be a real, uh, maybe a change in the process. Now, first of all, I must say that uh, uh, what I say, I, my, my wish is uh, actually to see that uh, what is there in the President Saubhagya Dakma or vistas of prosperity and splendor uh, could be carried out, you know. So that is what uh, my wish is, because because I saw at the initial stages as to how uh, this country has to be uh, groomed and how we can help the school. So first of all, I will uh, just give a little brief on the uh, school side uh, because that's the uh, most important thing. And one of the major uh, pr problems that we face is that the people who are passing out, uh, maybe last time in 2020, uh, we had 184,000 passing out but maybe universities uh, can accept about 35,000. So that's a major problem and uh, how one can resolve that. So that's uh, a matter that I would like to take up. But in addition to that, uh, we have a large number of art students coming out, you know, uh, 72,991. So it, uh, the majority of that is all uh, art students. But when you really look at the school structure, now we have about a uh, 4 million uh, uh, 4.2 million students, you know, and of course about 235,000 student uh, teachers. Uh, we have to make use of this uh, uh, digitalization that has taken place. This has really changed everything now. Even for our CPM Sri Lanka, this uh, we are using digital technology for this uh, seminar that we are holding. So the whole uh, method of uh, uh, the operations delivery has changed. So we need to ensure that this could be taken forward. Because I know that even in our own professional bodies, how we uh, manage to overcome the problems that are there and to go into the normal situation in order that the students would be able to benefit. Where the education is done online, where the examinations are done online, the registrations. So all activities are digitalized. So this is something that will change the whole structure of the education field. Because if you look at these schools, uh, you, you can really see what is really happening, you know. You know now uh, we have what is called the, the grade 12 to 13. Uh, there, are, there are the number of schools. It's only about a thousand odd schools uh, in that category, you know. But then if you look at the uh, A that is having science stream, only science stream, only thousand twelve, 12 schools. Then those with the A level, AL other than science, 1,899. Then the others up to grade 11, are the largest numbers, you know, if you look at the student numbers, uh, you will be really flabbergasted, you know, because uh, we, we are expecting something from what we are really doing, you know, 
because out of the you now if you really look at the primary and junior uh, schools there is 3 million students then the uh, senior secondary 627000 and the senior the the a level only 411000 so you can see what has really happened now even those people coming if you are unable to give them uh, 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 university education the technical education make them skilled people i think we are really in the wrong direction because uh, uh, maybe at the time of independence we said we had the best education but now the others have overtaken us and we are really at the real uh, top bottom you know it's a real real bottom we are so we need to make some drastic changes but i think this digitalization is one that will really change the whole scope so that we need to do because not only in the school because you see now if uh, if there are rural schools now that, that is the most important thing you know what the government should do is they must we give them money but they must uh, be able to tell us that every year the number of science graduates are uh, science people qualifying are increasing that means our students must come down so but that is really not happening so whatever that they do practically things are not happening so i think that's a very very important thing because i am telling this because uh, uh, today technology has been given the uh, topmost position now we have set up a technology ministry but then they, uh, if you want to uh, get technology to the rural areas to educate them then they have to do a quite a drastic change in how we are going to do the higher education because in india they did achieve this called the all india center for technical education and then that really changed the whole structure you know where it was openly available so this ministry of technology that has been set up has to do this they have to set up this and this will be taken through the country then how did the uh, indian you know, people uh, try to cater to these large numbers they what they did was now if you take some of the universities they have what is called affiliated colleges now these colleges now if you take pune university they have 600 affiliated colleges 600000 students so if we are also able to do, uh, use that same thing now supposing we set up this technology university then it will be able to set up at least 100 uh, uh, colleges then they will uh, train the students to sit the exams at the pune university this is like sitting the o level or the a level so uh, we need to make some drastic changes and also do that then the other one is the professional education if you look at professional education uh, they are all in, uh, incorporated by act of parliament then they have a very major role to play in this uh, society where yeah, because today the biggest problem that we have is people finish their education at 18 then there is a gap between going into the university and coming and then they pass out maybe 24 25 or 26 that is not the case in uk Uh, USA or India by 21 or 22 you you pass out then by 23 24 you do your masters that is how it happens you know so we are losing time and this is also another impact on the women because you see females if they pass out at 24 25 i don't know whether they are prepared to work but if they pass at 21 because today the unemployment or the people who are not working is about 75% of the females are not working but if you want to make them uh, uh, work uh, at least 3 4 4 5 years that they can work then this should be a way that we have to change so but this has been going on for so many years but then everyone is talking but nothing is happening but how long we can go because today we have now got the best weapon uh, uh, which has been uh, forced on us and we have done it that is the only way that people will do things you know people if you just say do this or do that they won't do but today we uh, for our existence we have to use the digital means so if we use this today the education can be in a very uh, very very good situation then i spoke of professional education why the professional education in demand because not only the uh, uh, academic side but the practical training is there so that's another thing that they can consider you know if you are in the university maybe after the first two years then you go and work and you can do your education by uh, digital means so there are a lot of things uh, that we can do with this uh, digital education and i think technology because uh, you see today people are asking uh, uh, fdi fdi but what have we got to offer now you take india uh, with the technological revolution they had 
they they have uh, now they have uh, foreign exchange earnings in the IT and BPM sector about US dollars 180 billion. We are maybe doing maybe uh, uh, four billion or five billion or whatever it is. But that is the revolution that will take. Everyone who comes to Sri Lanka, uh, they will uh, go back to India because we can't get the people to uh, the skilled people in this country. Any uh, no development will take place. Foreign uh, people will come, but they will put everything. They will employ all the foreigners. They are not going to employ your local people. What is the skills we have got? What is the education we have got? If we are going to set up our offshore banking center, our people, they must be produced to go and work in those places. So education is a must. And the change in the education has to be done if we are really to uh, go ahead. So uh, there are very many things that uh, I need to speak, but I think Uh, dra uh, drastically change the whole pattern, you know. Every every student who is studying at the A level will be able to do a degree. Then we have the vocational training, technical training, skill development that can be done. So all these have to be taken. So these are some of the things that I think uh, has to be done. And with the COVID-19 pandemic, we should go ahead and do this whole thing and we will be uh, successful and be able to catch up with the countries that have already overtaken us. Thank you, Professor. Thanks for that very uh, vocal uh, presentation of your wish list. I will now um, invite to represent the apparel sector, uh, Mr. Hasita Premaratna. Over to you. Thank you. Uh, uh, so, first of all, I think uh, we are getting into this budget uh, period with a very difficult economic. Uh, uh, condition in the country, so it's a, it's not a time where we can uh, see too much of concessions, tax uh, concessions in particular, uh, given the current circumstances that we are going through as a country, as an economy, as uh, well as as a government. I think there's a lot of challenges, but I would like to spell out uh, three important things, which primarily uh, look at the transformation of the apparel industry in Sri Lanka, uh, because. Uh, uh, we have seen the industry going through different uh, changes uh, time to time uh, and, and uh, <clears throat> certain key trends uh, that help the industry to transform and stay relevant and uh, maybe be cost, cost competitive and also uh, grow to the next level. So the, I would like to touch on three important areas given the limited time we have. Uh, so the first thing I would like to talk about is uh, on the uh, this hub concept, now, this is something that is not new. This is regulation is in uh, existence at the moment, right? To, for the hub concept, I'll just take a minute to explain what it is. Uh, now, Sri Lanka has a fairly a good uh, base of employees or, or uh, who, are, who are doing product development, design, uh, procurement, marketing, sales, uh, and other related front end activities in the country who have uh, developed themselves over a period of time. And in fact, if you look at a lot of our people are working in uh, Bangladesh, uh, Vietnam, Africa, elevating the apparel industry of those countries. But instead of- uh, Sean, just check your mic and see if there is some noise coming from there. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you, but there is some other noise coming. I don't know. My mic is muted. Uh, has it, you can continue. Yeah, okay. So, uh, from the industry perspective, I think it is important that we retain this uh, workforce we have, which is the white collar workforce, which uh, add a lot of value in this, what we call the front end activities, and augment the capability of the industry to go beyond the current level of 5 billion exports. Probably, if you look at uh, maybe maximum, we can go with the, the manufacturing in Sri Lanka, that is uh, for the factories to uh, um, uh, expand and grow and uh, go, go grow the industry, probably maybe another 20 to 25 percent. Uh, maybe take into about six and a half, seven billion dollars uh, uh, of export at best. But if you look at the opportunity that comes with uh, a possible hub concept, which means that we have the surrounding of India, Bangladesh, Pakistan, which add together counts to about almost a 1.8 billion population, right? 1.6, 1.8 billion population. So with that kind of population, there's a lot of poverty in the region. And we can be the hub to the region where once upon a time, uh, Hong Kong did that for to China, uh, where we still have the opportunity to continue on this basis and use our front end capabilities, which I explained before earlier, uh, and uh, look at how uh, 
we can have trading uh, hubs set up in sri lanka which outsource to uh, say to india to pakistan maybe to bangladesh and then uh, take that product out uh, and export it back to wherever the countries that we are sending at the moment so to encourage that concept i think uh, the laws were uh, passed and the budgets have uh, supported in the past and my uh, uh, request here is to further enhance that because there are certain elements especially from the uh, encouragement perspective that need to be done and some of the larger organizations in the industry today are doing including ourselves are doing this but i am talking about more bringing the smes at least the middle segment of the industry also uh, to be encouraged to be uh, uh, pushed to support this kind of a concept and and try to see how we can uh, grow beyond manufacturing in the parallel industry but also to look at how we can grow as a trading hub a front end hub uh, which can use the capacities of the region for which probably the profits uh, at the moment even in this export number we don't count this uh, what we call this entrepreneur trade uh component so that need to be first of all track separately and encourage to grow uh, so that we can bring in dollars into the country retain more dollars in the country and also uh, encourage more high paid white collar jobs so for that entrepreneur trade uh, the opportunity that you can get from uh, uh, the growth at least uh, to look at uh, but today income tax is applicable at the normal 14% rate that the export industry is uh, going in so uh, whether there can be concession on that front and also all the dividend repay creations that are going through this sub concept uh, we is also taxed under the dividend tax regulation so where whether there can be some relaxations on that area is something that can encourage uh, small timers also to move in this area and also for foreign investment also to further come in uh, to set up trading hubs and expand in the uh, overall region so that's the first thing the second trend i want i want to talk about is on the innovation and automation side uh, these are very hot topics that we all listen read in uh, media uh, but the in reality when you look at the product development is absolute must for us to move beyond the traditional what we call the uh, copy and shop type of uh, operation or the business we used to do which we call a take back business uh, but we do our own products and we uh, design develop and then we uh, uh, offer them to our brands or the, our buyers and through uh, that Uh, for for our buyers to uh, uh, basically rely on us or, or on 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 our uh, forces to look at these uh, developments to happen in the countries like in, in Sri Lanka uh, today most of those things happen in New York or London or expensive destinations but we can move that work to Sri Lanka uh, and and look at how we can develop on this area so uh, research and development related uh, work that is happening to improve product innovation on one side and on the other side to improve the automation of the manufacturing facility so that we can improve the productivity which is absolute must to stay competitive in the industry uh, from a from a uh, broader global competitiveness perspective so that's a, the in in doing that uh, obviously this r&d research and development expenditure that are being uh, taken today there is a double uh, uh, the uh, double uh, deduction available that means you can deduct 200% of what you spend uh, for tax purposes and it was at a time at 300% but it has been reduced now so our request has been to look at the 300% deduction and encourage more and more uh, at, at not only the large organizations but also the medium sized organizations to drive towards that concept of uh, automations and uh, product development side and also to attract foreign investment in these areas which will transform the parallel industry to the next level so that's the second thing the third uh, Uh, element is more on the tax administration and the related area side especially uh, the other topic of uh, the changing trends in the industry is digitization now when we were forced with covid uh, in april 2020 to operate from home and operate from uh, remote locations uh, i think uh, uh, we were able to somehow pull through uh, the customs uh, inland revenue systems and also the boi approval systems all of that together and operate uh, without uh, a big disruption but i think there are areas within that segment which need some encouragement and the finance ministry in the last couple of budgets have uh, given direction and even resources to that matter for the sri lanka's customs as well as to the inland revenue department to digitize the activities and uh, look at how they can take the uh, paperless environment to be encouraged so that it gives the not only actually the parallel industry the whole of the export industry um, big relief when it comes to the day to day operation mechanism to take take things forward so 
first thing is customs, inland revenue, and the BOI uh, has to come together in this because it has to be one end to end solution that has to come. Because if one uh, uh, the department moves forward but the other don't, that means you're not moving as a uh, overall system or a process forward. So that's something that we need to see that all three are organizations work together. So we have the Asikuda system, which is under the customs. We have the Ramis under the internal revenue. Uh, so these need to come together. And also BOI now has a system as well, but this need to get fast track in the digitization journey so that we can have the digital submission of the invoices, automated uh, export re <laughs> releases to be done, import side of things to be encouraged on these front for what we import to re-export back uh, so that there'll be an end-to-end uh, paperless uh, process being brought in. So this is more of a tax administration, but I think the, the finance minister has given in previous two budgets the direction towards this uh, journey. Uh, what we request at this stage is to uh, uh, provide the resources and the support for change management, which is an integral part of the success of the digitization journey to be uh, brought in with uh, specific uh, initiatives and resources at this stage so that we can fast track the journey and uh, probably not get back to the old days after COVID, but stay within the processes and even probably strengthen what we had done in the in the uh, last maybe one year or so and make it more sustainable and system and process driven. So those are the three uh, important uh, trends which I would uh, request uh, encouragement, uh, enablement and uh, development uh, support through this uh, budget. Firstly, uh, the support of the hub concept that brings more dollars to the country uh, and, and enables uh, the white collar jobs to earn more money and build up the existing skills and take it to the next level without losing them to another country. Uh, the second thing is the R&D part of it, which is the product development and automation part to be encouraged to the, to the R&D allow, allowance to be enhanced. And thirdly, the digitization more in the tax administration side to be encouraged further so that the digitization paperless environment to be made a system driven, process driven, uh, sustainable journey. So, those are the three things I would like to highlight uh, at this point, which, which we have uh, uh, many other interesting topics, but I think these are the three things that matter most at this stage to transform the industry. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Hasita. It's a, it's a very uh, brief, very uh, conscious attempt to put your thoughts into the wish list. Appreciate. Uh, your thoughts, and we'll be now crossing over to the agriculture sector and representing Mr. Rizvi Said um, to give the uh, give his views on the wish list. Over to you, sir. Thank you, Ashan. Uh, very quickly, let me dive straight away to to the wish list. Uh, as we all know, uh, there are some uh, pressing uh, actions that are required on the agriculture sector in order to to make a contribution towards the development of the country. And I'd like to start with the very first one, controversial though it may be, and this is arising from the, the ban on the chemical fertilizers and agrochemicals. This has been subject to a lot of discussion, but yet uh, with all the analysis done by, by industry experts, by academic uh, community, the scientists, and also importantly, the Sri Lanka Agricultural Economics Association, uh, the impact on Sri Lanka in terms of uh, the predicted crop losses, which is not adequately addressed and has got huge implications on both uh, the, uh, the import and export bills as well. Uh, tea is expected to, to drop by 30% as a result of the absence of uh, fertilizers. Uh, paddy uh, by also about 30, in some estimates, 40% reduction. Maize, which is important not only for the the animal feed sector, but also for farmer support and income, rural incomes uh, uh, estimated drop by up to 50%, sugarcane 30% drop and cinnamon 25%. And these are some of the top uh, uh, five crops that are expected to be affected by the fertilizer ban. So the immediate first uh, wish list is that uh, the ban on the fertilizers to be restricted by 50%. Now there's a 100% ban. Now, the National Fertilizer Secretariat has got the statistics. In any case, the imports of chemical fertilizers is controlled by the National Fertilizer Secretariat. So what we are saying, and I'm sure the country also can benefit in the road to be organic or to be safe, and that's, I think, overall the objective of government, is that without impairing the sector, the immediate request is to, to make a 50% ban so that in three to five years' time, there's enough of runway for Sri Lanka to go towards 
a safe uh, agricultural regime where we don't have toxins in our food, etc. So 50% ban is the immediate request, and this will save a lot of heartburn. It is expected that uh, with the other crops, that uh, the impact as a result of having to import, uh, for example, rice, rice import will as a result of 30-40% uh, reduction in the paddy crop after the, the current fertilized stocks are exhausted, can go up to rupees 42 billion. This is on the estimate of the Sri Lanka Agricultural Economics Association, very detailed estimations done. Together with all the other crops, the impact on both the import and export sectors is a loss or cost in, in excess of 1 billion US dollars. So all of this can be resolved if this first key item on the wish list is to make the ban 50% reduction in, in chemical fertilizers and agrochemicals, and then a phase out over a three to five year ban, which will avoid a lot of this hard burn. No doubt everybody in the agriculture sector is aware that Sri Lanka needs to go to sustainable agriculture, whether it is on the, the cash crops or whether it's the perennial crops, whether it's focused on the exports, we have to go to sustainable agriculture. And uh, in some ways, this is a short, sharp shock, but the shock is so acute, it could tantamount to throwing the baby out with the bathwater unless this first item on the fish list, the fish list is, is, uh, is taken into account. And that is, I think, a compromise, a 50%, and this needs to be done immediately. Otherwise, there could be serious consequences for the agriculture sector. The second item on the wish list is, of course, with planting material. And seeds and planting materials are very important because agriculture productivity is not very high. Sri Lanka is very good when it comes to the paddy and the rice crop. We have got safe sufficiency in rice, thanks to all the excellent breeding work that has been done by the Department of Agriculture over the last three decades. But we have failed in the fruits and vegetable segment to, to get our yields up. Although there are other issues in, in distribution and cost, but still currently there is a very laggardly process for approving uh, seeds and planting materials. Of course, this comes under the purview of the Department of Agriculture. But if the emphasis is driven from the national budget, to fast track approval and setting up what it may take in terms of budget provisions to increase the approval timelines to under three months at the most, this will help to bring better quality seeds and party materials into the country. The third very, very important one is with regard to transport and logistics hubs at provincial level. This is to supplement the economic centers. Now, uh, clearly Sri Lanka is making some progress with regard to some yields. And we are getting cost of production also to a reasonable level. But if you look at the, the spread between cost of production at farm gate to retail price, other than in the case of some of the supermarkets who have set up their own uh, value chains, we can see that when the product reaches the consumer, the costs of vegetables and fruit are so exorbitant. And this is because uh, we don't discount the role of the middleman, but there are some exorbitant costs that involve transport and logistics. So the proposal, and I wish this thought, is the setting up as a PPP, provincial level transport and logistics hubs. Now this has to be fashioned carefully, but there has to be some investment from the part of the provincial councils. And I believe a lot of the local government agencies have got some funds available. And if we can work from those funds, uh, a system for having private public partnerships of logistics and transport hubs, where instead of farmers and producers taking everything to the closest economic center and all the vagaries and the downsides of that, we have a provincial, very economically driven hub that takes care of logistics and storage, including uh, solar powered coal storage and all of that. And I'm sure from the private sector, there are a lot of people who are willing to invest, provided some public good investment is made in terms of making use of resources in the provinces. So that's a very third one. This is a low hanging fruit literally and can make a big impact to bringing down the costs of vegetables and ensuring farmer incomes and the farmers uh, get a reasonable price for the produce that they, they have. Then the fourth very important wish list item is with regard to investment in R&D in agriculture. Now, as was said earlier, clearly, there is a huge role for digital technology to take place or to take uh, uh, get a part of the action in agriculture. Already, this is happening. We see that very aggressively. A lot of startups, whether young startups, whether people involved in agriculture or in the digital uh, 
uh, area, they have come in with lots of innovative products, innovative uh, areas. So there's a whole scope of agri tech innovations that need to be supported. Now there are startup companies that are doing first round, second round, third rounds of calls, et cetera, various ways, but there is something that has to encourage even people who are currently involved in agriculture to put more money into R&D. A few years ago, some years ago, there was this concept of the 300% tax deductibility for all R&D investment, starting with agriculture. Of course, other areas also required. Sri Lanka has to have an innovation culture in agriculture, and that has to come from, whilst we have a lot of tax incentives, tax holidays, low tax income tax for the agriculture sector, this innovation in agriculture, the culture of innovation has to come from encouraging investment. And so the R&D spend, if it is supported uh, with a fairly pragmatic administration through the tax department of a 300% tax deductibility into any R&D investment in agriculture uh, is very likely to give a huge kickstart and a, a huge takeoff to investment in ag tech, including things like the use of the IoT, artificial intelligence, digital twins and all of that. And companies can start investing in modern ways in which to improve agricultural productivity, to look at solutions for transport, to look at supply chain resiliency, et cetera. So this investment in 300% uh, tax investment is, is a strongly made wish list item. And I'm sure if it is administered pragmatically, uh, with, without too much of uh, controls, uh, I'm sure this will make a big impact to the innovation culture in the agriculture sector. Uh, and the next item, the fifth one, is with something uh, Suresh Timel alluded to, the export houses. Now, clearly, where agriculture is concerned, the road to success, both from the point of view of foreign exchange, as well as increased incomes to farmers, and of course, the third item is good ROI for people in boss investing in agriculture whether they be SMEs or the larger companies, is that we have to have strong value-added export support. And there is no other way other than to follow some good practices like what happened in Japan, in Korea, and that is the concept of export houses. And I must laud uh, Suresh and his team, and I think uh, Professor Lakshman also got involved. We have to fast track the setting up of export houses and offering incentives with a model that the Export Development Board, I believe, will, will, will develop to encourage private investment and equity into these models of export houses and then link smallholders and producers together with the innovative value addition partners in ag tech into export houses and then the, all the front ending into export markets, the basic market research, the innovative work. Now I know for a certain there are a whole slew of new products, meaning superfoods and products and foods that are driven by the demand from the COVID pandemic immunity boosting foods, plant-based meat substitutes derived from products like the jackfruit in Sri Lanka. For example, the jackfruit which is grown in, in homesteads as a home garden product, if used with technology and done on a commercial scale, where we use various types of growing technologies, processing technologies to produce a meat-based substitute, which is, which is an amazing product that the global demand, which is expected to, to rise in the coming years, currently estimated that 36 billion US dollars. This is the meat based uh, meat, uh, the substitute, plant based meat substitute. So, a lot of investment has to be done in the RD area. And this, uh, together with the export houses, can make a big impact. So, export houses, together with private investment and encouragement uh, for private equity to get into a PPP led by the Export Development Board, will help to take off and fast track the export houses. Uh, the other last point I have is with regard to the cost of organic certification. Now, organic certification for an SME or a smallholder is a tough one. It can go up to 700,000, 500,000 rupees for certification organically. And if you can find a way uh, and a proposal to pro provide a, a, up to about 75% of the cost, either as a subsidy or a credit guarantee for a company that is going to uh, get uh, organic certification, this will help to take organic products quickly, even in spices and various other uh, organic products as well. So those, these are my initial thoughts on the agriculture sector. As we go on, I'm sure we will have a fair amount of questions in this subject as well. Thank you. Over to you, Hasha. Thank you, uh, Mr. Rizvi. Uh, Saheed, well, innovation is the key in, it's, it's everywhere in his speech, meaning passionate to introduce it. So 
with that we we now we are now turning into phase 2 we just ended the phase 1 and um, that's the q and a session i will now hand it over to the evergreen mr nista kasim over to you sir thanks ashan uh, <clears throat> uh, i must commend all the panelists for excellent uh, recommendations i am I'm, I'm sure i hope uh, government uh, somebody from the government uh, would get uh, would get some information based on the recommendation. So uh, I have a few questions lined up, but I, I like to, in the, uh, because there are lots of questions from the audience, I like to take uh, them first and then maybe uh, crisscross between my questions as well as uh, audience questions. Uh, I also invite everyone to uh, uh, post questions uh, from those people who have not yet. And because this panel is fairly practical panel, so uh, I've Try, let's try and make the best out of it. Um, uh, Asita, I'll just start from you. Uh, there was this question about, um, 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 is about how Bangladesh has succeeded uh, uh, or, or very successful model. Uh, but I think you also mentioned in your presentation that uh, we need to go up in the value chain, uh, for, for particularly R&D. But we, I'm sure in the next few years, we'll, we'll be temptation is to compare us with Bangladesh or Vietnam. Uh, is that comparison or benchmarking is good or should we sort of focus on going on our own own journey? Well, uh, Rista, my view is I think we should look at uh, uh, Bangladesh uh, in a way as a competitor, but not necessarily as a complete benchmark uh, to, to uh, fight uh, against because we have a lot to complement with Bangladesh than compete in my opinion. Uh, so what we should ideally do is like what I explained before to look at how we can uh, develop our capabilities uh, and we have a limited population as we all know and limited working population uh, and with the current numbers in the industry going up to 300 to 400,000 uh, direct workforce uh, that uh, but there's a limit that that, that number can increase to uh, and also the Bangladesh uh, with 160 million population almost eight times of our population uh, there is a very different uh, advantage that uh, Bangladesh is uh, enjoying from a scalability perspective and, and, and the significant property uh, and as a result of that there is a lot more workforce available there uh, so I think uh, our uh, we should identify our niche and differentiate ourselves on product development area in particular, uh, then on the sourcing capabilities, uh, customer relationships, the other front end measures, and look at the trading hub concept uh, as, as a top priority to see that we grow beyond manufacturing in the apparel industry. So uh, our general mindset is when you talk about apparel, it's about you think about a factory, right? Uh, it's good. I mean, that's 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 where you create certain level of employment in the country. But once you cross that uh, threshold, uh, white collar jobs brings uh, more dollars, more uh, uh, kind of value addition to the overall scheme of things. Where maybe the net value addition might be overall less, but still that amount of dollars you can bring can be unlimited. So you today you're talking about a five billion dollar industry. Uh, our manufacturing capability in Sri Lanka can take it maybe to seven, six, seven billion, right? But if you look at the hub concept, we can take to 20, 25, 30 billion dollars because we are not manufacturing here. We can actually use the other concept. And Bangladesh can be a complement. Right. Uh, what other than cheap labor and, and the sheer size of it, uh, any other things that Sri Lanka can immediately, uh, uh, you know, adapt from Bangladesh? Anything that is in relation to your our, our new positioning? Is there anything that we can immediately implement in terms of policy or, or procedure? Yeah, I think the, the biggest thing Bangladesh offer is uh, they have a fair amount of uh, uh, seamless uh, operation uh, in the country but of course the FTA is not the big thing is the foreign, foreign free trade agreements uh, there is uh, duty free to uh, Europe duty free to uh, uh, Japan and some of the Chinese uh, exports are duty free Canada is duty free uh, Australia is there so there are multiple markets that are duty free from uh, uh, Bangladesh, whereas we are only having advantage to Europe at the moment where GSP plus is also under somewhat uh, pressure and threat and it's anyway uh, expiring as we progress into the next level of income level from a per capita perspective. So I would uh, look at Nista, Turkey, Italy um, and some of the European countries uh, as our benchmarks and even Hong Kong for that matter who was uh, 
uh, who played an extensive role of a trading hub to China, right? And look at some of those regulations and see how we can adopt uh, some of those things, including what I mentioned on the digitization drive, which will make an investor uh, to come and set up a trading operation and run a seamless operation with uh, the latest technology. So we need technology, we need digitization, and we need those uh, regulations to be enhanced probably with some incentives from the budget uh, that can be given uh, to support the cost. But I would not uh, say that we can pick up manufacturing per se as, as, a, as a learning from Bangladesh. Uh, their logistics are quite bad with a single port in uh, Chittagong. We have multiple ports, our ports are much efficient than that. So we have a lot of advantages. So we have to make sure that we pick up those advantages and we develop on that to differentiate ourselves in, our, in the industry. I think the larger companies are doing that, including Brandix, right? But I'm talking about a larger number of companies, especially spreading this to the SME sector and see how uh, the, the medium-sized companies also can look at this concept and really push the envelope to create a larger presence uh, of the industry which can grow to the next level okay well one last question in in relation to your suggestion uh, uh, going up in the value chain becoming a i mean i know um, you're looking at white collar jobs but what's the alternative for the people uh, factory floor level workers i mean can they sort of transform into some 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 other sector over a three to five year period or, or i mean how, there should be some more manage transition as well uh, have you have you, has the industry looked at that what might be the shakedown let me clarify we are not talking about any reduction in the factory operations okay. we are talking about the factory operations that are prevailing today as i said before generate about a five billion dollar export right even if we hire more people probably we'll max out at six to seven billion dollar level of apparel industry right you can't go below that so i'm not talking at by any means by any means that we will reduce the number of people in fact we want more people with the factory flow so if you can find more people please do please help us right we will be there to take in then industry is uh, dying for people at the moment at the factory flow so i think that level of workforce is in need that's a scarcity at the moment in the country so whatever we have we will take i'm talking about growing beyond that and more important more important is the one point where there is uh, that uh, automation and related areas will also improve the productivity of the factory workforce so it, even if we uh, uh, can't proportionately increase the number of uh, workforce uh, to support the export growth we can also get a boost with the productivity if automation comes in so that's another angle that we should not forget about that. okay thank you uh, Shiromal, there is a question for you as well. I think you did mention, but I think maybe people want more uh, more clarity. Um, uh, isn't it a good proposal to grant an interest holiday from uh, uh, from banks for two years for the tourism industry? Um, I know you come from a bank. You also coming. You also hold a directorship in in the bank. So I'm. I'm it's very interesting to see you advocating a, a write-off of interest. <laughs> uh, yeah. how, fe how feasible is this? I know it's a wish list, but let's be more practical. Uh, uh, one is the extension of the moratorium till for by another till end 2023. Uh, no, 22 actually. 22, yeah. Um, uh, this uh, waiver of interest or freezing interest uh, for two days, two years, is that practical? Or? Um, that's what I said. I mean, as I think Hasit also mentioned, these are difficult times for the country and for the banks also. Banks are also quite stressed. But uh, if tourism is, if the players are going to raise their heads and go forward, I think that is essential. I know, as I said before, a bank is responsible to their depositors and, and to the shareholders. So uh, lenders borrow money expecting to pay and then their banks give in good faith but uh, the fact is this has nothing to do with the lend borrowers uh, you know not that they have done bad management or it, it's just happened you know it's uh, and I think most of them have planned or had had uh, there is uh, some kind of reserves left but I think most of it has also been used up and uh, going forward I think they should be given a little bit of time to get their act together. So to answer your question, Nista, as I said, it's tough for, the, for us to expect the banks to write it off completely without assistance from the government. Okay. So if the government can give them a tax credit, because banks are also paying uh, huge taxes, 
So if they can give that as a set off, then the banks are not losing out in the quantum of money that they they are they are writing off. So they should definitely be compensated for it. Uh, but that would be the ideal balance, ideal comp uh, compromise if banks can be compensated. If the tourism industry, whether it is a, a person who has a lease vehicle or whether it is an employee in a tourism industry who has taken a loan, uh, all of them are going to find it really difficult uh, to pay off two years rent in areas. So if that concession can be given, that would be really great. And the, the, as I said, the primary thing on my wish list. Okay, <clears throat> the uh, uh, related point in that question is also uh, suspending it uh, at least fifty percent of it. But you are looking at a total write-off of the interest, right? Not ideally. Not the delay. Ideally, <clears throat> but yeah, I mean, okay, the, if fifty would be okay, but then we would obviously want a hundred percent write-off. Okay. Uh, it, it can be worked out by the government, but I'm not expecting the banks to do it. Uh, because uh, banks are also running, uh, you know, it's a business they're doing, plus they are responsible to the depositors for their money. So we don't want to stress the banking system, but uh, with the help of the government, if it can be worked out, that would be great. Okay, thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> uh, uh, Professor, there are some welcome uh, suggestions to you as well. Uh, there is one particular question about uh, about you mentioned so much about people going into ask art uh, stream. Uh, the question is, you know, uh, I mean, rural schools have no other choice because there aren't enough resources to go into other streams. Uh, how can this be kind of? What would be your recommendation? Yeah, no. Uh, what we are saying is that uh, we need to uh, give them the opportunity also to do. Uh, uh, science or technology. So those are two areas that one has to look into. So that has to be uh, brought in, you know, because uh, when you say rural schools, it will not be all the schools, but it can be uh, maybe a main school, uh, what they earlier call like uh, a central school or whatever it is. Uh, so that then uh, that will cover a cluster of schools, you know. So that is the system that uh, will have to work. Because when you look at the numbers, uh, actually, the large number on the art side, plus also, uh, it may be that they have not had the opportunity. If they had the opportunity and if they are uh, uh, maybe past the A level, then maybe uh, we should also give them another opportunity to see whether they will be able to fit into any other stream. Whether they come into the science stream or IT stream or whatever that is there, which will also help them. Of course, generally, what they say is. Uh, art student who has uh, done IT, uh, English, uh, and can uh, do the uh, communication, uh, they are able to get jobs. That's what uh, 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 we have ha heard from the universities. Uh, maybe uh, even the uh, when we had this seminar, the uh, UGC had uh, mentioned that that was some time back in 2019. But that is what they said. Okay. <clears throat> There's a related question about uh, what would be your solution for the uh, brain drain that's happening. I'm sure with the pandemic, we, we see there was a report that uh, the high, large number of Sri Lankans are... Yeah, brain drain is also... Uh, Seeing uh, OCs. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah. With, uh, of course, it's really uh, the economic development that is taking place and uh, maybe the salaries and other things that one is uh, considering. Uh, so those are things that one has to see. But uh, if you see now, that's why you are saying that supposing if we can get, uh, if we have a large number, maybe IT qualified. Now, even now, they say there are 20,000 vacancies in the IT BPM industry. So if we are able to meet that, then even for the foreigners to come here, then they will be able to uh, not only uh, give the opportunities, but they will also pay better salaries. So that's uh, something that would be created and the demand, you see, even in India, if you look at it, the real revolution in the technology uh, exports took place with the uh, skills that were developed with the engineering and the IT uh, graduates that, uh, that, were, uh, that were produced by the university. So we need to uh, go into that because that's a very, very uh, major area where we can compete. 
So uh, we have to uh, bring this education uh, to that point. That's why I said that if a, a technological university is set up, but the, uh, it has to be a public-private partnership because now uh, we have found that the government cannot meet these large numbers. That means when you say public-private, like in India, you have the uh, state university, then uh, affiliated to that are the colleges. And the colleges will uh, prepare them for the same exam. So everyone will be sitting, say, if I said Pune University, they will be sitting the Pune University, uh, either IT, uh, IT degree or the engineering degree, and uh, they will be getting that certificate and that will be recognized. And they also ensure that the standards are maintained rather than opening a new one. And this is the fastest way to do it, you know, because government can't open up universities everywhere. They have no power. They have no money. But maybe IT would come in. But still, uh, this is the best way that uh, you can give education, higher education to a larger number. Okay, fine. Thank you. Shiramal, I need to come back to you because I saw some uh, two questions again. Uh, one is about uh, uh, leasing companies continuing to um, uh, impose what's called a late fee and interest and uh, are you aware i know you may, maybe you're not directly involved in a leasing company <clears throat> that's one question and also the other one what is the impact on the airline industry i know you uh, have two questions yeah so i do agree some of the leasing companies have been enforcing this but in fairness to the government they had made a request to everybody including the leasing companies not to uh, enforce that, but uh, it is unfortunate that some are doing it. And whenever we are aware of it, see, among of our suppliers have been uh, having to undergo that, we are helping out. We are trying to talk to the leasing companies and asking them. And I think lots of other companies also doing that. So uh, that is unfortunate and it should be stopped because government has also requested, as I said, um, with regards to the airline industry, what do you mean? Uh, should they be given any? No, no. What's the what kind of impact uh, you see, and whether any? Anyway, I mean, maybe in general, whether what about what, is there any? I, I know they come under the general travel tourism in terms of mm. death moratorium and all that. But is there any specific impact? Uh, so I think uh, different airlines are fine doing different things. You know, for example, Qatar. Um, continued to fly and uh, they, they didn't really stop their services whereas Emirates did stop uh, certain destinations and they are picking up one by one. Sri Lankan Airlines was the same uh, but of course Sri Lankan Airlines has various other challenges which I think everybody knows so one needs to decide uh, they've done an excellent job helping the tourism industry. When everybody has stopped flying, Sri Lankan was flying, whether it was during the war or even now in the pandemic. But uh, I do understand it is uh, costing the country quite a lot of money. So we need to find efficient ways of doing things. Uh, uh, so it, it is definitely a concern, but we do need an airline and the airline has been helping the tourism industry. Uh, we've been doing lots of joint promotions. Even now, uh, they are kicking off uh, promotions in um, in Russia, in uh, France, in uh, India. So it's important, but uh, I wish it, it could be run more efficiently. Okay, right. Thank you. <clears throat> uh, Rizvi, there's also lots of uh, uh, people commending your suggestions. The, <clears throat> uh, the, there are a few questions about... Uh, the need for more intermediary support in this part of finding foreign buyers for agriculture products. Uh, how that, I know you spoke about, I'll come to uh, fertilizer related recommendations, but in terms of finding foreign buyers for agriculture products, do you think uh, uh, any potential exporter has enough opportunities right now? If so, where can they get this uh, support? Yes, Mr. I, I think this is an issue that is always uh, but Sri Lanka's export of the value-added agricultural products, even fresh. Fresh, of course, as, as you know, Sri Lanka was able to leverage on the demand in the nearby countries of the Maldives and the Middle East because of the familiarity and all of that. Sri Lanka did well. Their SMEs and small guys were able to, to have collecting systems with the various vegetable growers and have market access to countries nearby. 
But as, as you can see, historically, over the last three decades, the companies that have gone beyond uh, the geographical proximity of the Maldives or the Middle East have been some of the larger companies. And I know companies that uh, I was involved in, like Haley's and a few others, uh, took the, the route, like how Dilma did, of course, with the value-added key, uh, is to go beyond, and that involves some costs and some risks. Now, not everybody amongst the larger companies, particularly for value-added product, and if you are not going to sell to a, to a brand, uh, let's say, for example, like in the apparel industry, etc., if you are taking your own produce and you're going to sell it to a buyer's market and brand, you have to go beyond. And one way that uh, there has been support is through the Export Development Board. Since it's exception, I, did, did, I think did an excellent job in organizing Sri Lankan smallholders, small companies through the Sri Lankan pavilions to go to, to Europe. Now, that Suresh is not there right now. That needs to be increased to a higher level. Uh, maybe the budget allocation to take a larger team to go to some of the export fairs, even though physically it's not possible to do that right now. There is interesting opportunities and either it has to come from uh, physical attendance at fairs and as I said earlier, there is a lot of possibilities with using e-commerce or digital commerce. But our, uh, our exporters need to know how and where and what to do when you have a product developing catalogs, developing uh, uh, e-commerce platforms to show your various value-added products, what are the production systems, what are the quality uh, systems that we have. So there's a, a training component also required to help uh, locate buyers for all of the smallholders. On the supply side of it, there's also a need for consolidating the growing because Sri Lanka has small holdings. Average farm holding size is about two to three acres and that also uh, different disparate geographic zones. So there is a case for having nucleus farms and this is something that I have earlier promoted as well incentives for companies to come together to form nucleus farms and concessions for linking SMEs to those uh, nucleus farms. So SMEs need the funding, they need some kind of credit guarantees to, to take the risk of investment in agriculture where they have to do some basic processing. So it's not an easy answer to talk about finding markets, but the starting point is first to locate those customers. Now, I know in my journey where we have developed some very sustainable uh, market-driven agricultural value chains, uh, uh, global ones at that, it was making the first connection with the winning credibility, uh, starting from small successes, uh, building your reputation, like what I think the good example is Dilma, moving from doing the right things on the branding, so a lot of branding has to be done. But it can be done, but there has to be some uh, smallholder support so that we can clone from like what the Brandix and MAS and the government guys have been doing, replicate some practices and go from small wins. So export houses are a good way to go, but a lot of support is required uh, via the EDB. But I think importantly, as I said a little while ago, is the training to use e-commerce platforms, even with small holders, because as I said, there are opportunities in this pandemic era for a lot of value-added products, products that can go into the wellness market, that can go into immunity boosting food markets and our spices. And already we see that happening. And as Suresh said, the scalability has been an issue. So we have to ensure that we develop a scalability in terms of innovation, investment in R&D, and then trialing those products in global markets. And once we begin to score those small wins, it's just a matter of time. And we don't need to take 30 years like what happened in, in the case we were building uh, markets for agri-value agri added produce. With e-commerce, you can fast track that into six month, one year platforms. So I think there's a lot going. We require some focus and with the right incentives we spoke about earlier, I'm sure that can be fast track learning stuff. Right. Okay. Uh, just coming back to your suggestion about 50% uh, fertilizer uh, proposal. Um, I know this phased out strategy has been recommended by everybody, uh, but government or the president seems uh, uh, very adamant that uh, no, no change in policy. Uh, my question is, uh, how receptive would the government be uh, for this 50% uh, 
suggestion. Uh, have you all made this representation uh, to the agriculture minister at least and what has been the feedback? And then how do you ensure it's 50%? Uh, then it becomes another impractical situation. How would you handle the bottlenecks? Yes, uh, starting Nisha, with your last comment with regard to how do you handle the 50%, uh, as I said earlier, the National Fertilizer Secretariat issues the license or the permits for importation of any, any chemical. So they can control the 50%. They can only issue permits for 50% urea or 50% of compound fertilizer. And the way to go is to go for this, what is called this new generation fertilizer. But sadly, there is not enough receptivity even to new generation fertilizer because there is a component of the chemical in it. And nowhere in the world has agriculture or modern agriculture succeeded without these types of uh, what I call control, new release, new generation fertilizer that has got a chemical component. So the issue here is the safe use of these products. So uh, it goes down to convincing. As you said, we have made representations to the agriculture minister and the others, I think uh, something gave a little bit because as you know, that there was a, a gazette that came that started permitting some amount of the use of uh, these fertilizers, the compound fertilizers, but then very quickly there was a pushback and uh, it was more kind of an emotional response. But we have to go, Nishta, and I'm sure the whole of the, the country and the agriculture community, the scientific community realizes, as I said earlier, those drops in crop losses are phenomenal if done suddenly. Definitely, I think the whole of the agriculture sector is also now enlightened that we need to move towards sustainable farming, farming that will help us to have safe food, etc. And therefore, that three to five year phase out is necessary. So the way to go, this is why it is important to show the impacts. What are the fallouts? What are the, the balance of sheet implications? What are the implications on the national economy? What are the implications on living? What are the implications on our very high uh, our per capita income for the farming community? What are those impacts on nutrition? What is the impact on the, the wastage factor among children below five years? Now that's being highlighted and I think our scientific, scientific community, not that they were asleep, is woken up in supporting that. So it's a matter of time before traction happens. And that's why we're also putting this need for urgency. And I know 50% is not the, the best answer. It's just that we have to couple that with a lot of R&D work on organic products, uh, products that can uh, do farming in a responsible way, using vertical farming systems. All of this is in some way the positive side of the sudden ban. It's woken up people. It's a wake up call. So it's, I think if we work with the 50% and show the downside, and this is what we are trying to do, I'm sure uh, we will get traction with this proposal. Okay, thank you. There is one question to you with regard to, I know you mentioned about uh, PPP logistics and storage and transport uh, as a model. Uh, the question is about, uh, should the economic centers be self-governed with le least intervention from the state, uh, while state can be the infrastructure provider, uh, can can uh, private sector, uh, you know, I mean, uh, there is always this fear on the private sector that never get involved in that segment of the business. Because it's there's always it's a very politically sensitive subject. Sure. No, with, the, with regards to the economic center, Nista, as we all know, uh, particularly with the, the pandemic and the immediate uh, effects of the first wave, etc., there were serious uh, serious uh, 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 supply chain issues that caused shortage of uh, fruits and vegetables and food. But fortunately, uh, there were a lot of uh, private sector parties that came up with amazing e-commerce solutions. We started seeing a lot of work happening and the supply chain got steadied after a while. Now expand that to a larger, larger level. Now we have the economic centers. We can see with the recent third and fourth waves also, the farmers are crying. They are bringing products into the economic centers. The old model reigns that they bring in the product. They can't sell it. They got to leave it in a lot of food wastage. 40-50% of agriculture produce is wasted, uh, crop losses post harvest. So the idea is that whilst we do respect government policy and all that government should not get into the business of business because for whatever reason, there has to be some economic motivation to bring in a result. So that's why if we use the assets in the provinces as a public good, for example, if we craft the model and if the budget can spell out a model then maybe with uh, either with the chambers of commerce or organizations involved in agriculture to craft the model, 
uh, government assets in the provinces can be made use of, and then private sector will manage it. As you said, there is always a fear of private sector not wanting to go in, but because of land, most of the land is in the hands of government. That's number one, and there are a lot of assets that are idling. If those can be made use of, and it is uh, managed in a in a way that the private, for example, there can be uh, companies that uh, in each province take one center, and this whole distribution part is one that is lacking. So that uh, the costs of fruits and vegetables can come down by ensuring rapid deployment, and there are some models being looked at right now. And I'm sure in a couple of months those will come on stream as well. But there is definitely a need for government support because a lot of the assets that are idling in the provinces, and a lot of provincial and council local government bodies are, are have a lot of funds and they are willing. There's a federation of uh, local government uh, agencies. They are very pragmatic. They are willing to start working in partnership with the private sector. The private sector will manage it uh, in terms of the logistics, the transport, uh, the low cost solar, coal room. So that that has to come. Otherwise, we will not have been able to solve the problem of the the high price of vegetables. Okay, thanks. There are a lot of questions for you, but I'll move on. To, I'll come back to you later. Hasita, uh, just getting back to apparel. Uh, the uh, the question there. It's also there's a question in, from the audience. Is about uh, is there an alternative to GSP plus? Uh, what are the chances? I know industry has no real say in it, but is industry lobbying to secure GSP plus or not secure to ensure it remains uh, available? If not, in the absence of uh, no GSP plus, what alternatives uh, is there for Sri Lanka? Yeah, so Nista, first of all, in the short term, I think it's absolute necessity because uh, till 2023, in we were banking on GSP plus to continue, and then another review comes in, and then obviously the continuation will depend on the uh, economic parameters and the qualification criteria going forward. So from a short term perspective, I think the industry has been benefiting from it, and it's been looking forward to the continuation. So we have been uh, in touch with the government and and the related responses with the uh, European Union. Uh, Parliament, which they when they came out with the um, uh, additional uh, uh, you know expectations from Sri Lanka being set out, but it was not really a cancellation or a direction to cancel. I must uh, reiterate that it was more of uh, looking at uh, a response from the government to begin with, and it'll take it takes some more time, and it'll be kind of a uh, process uh, which will take a while so we believe that it will take give us more time to continue on that front and hopefully a continuation beyond 2023 as well but that's it if it doesn't continue beyond 23 because of not because of any other reason but because probably the economic reasons and if we have increased our per capita beyond a point uh, then uh, uh, naturally from a medium to long term perspective we should prepare to operate without the duty benefits for which I think that's one of the things that I mentioned before particularly on the productive development, the innovation side of things and then coming into the automation and productivity improvement because naturally we'll have to stay uh, cost competitive in the in the overall scheme of things without duty if you want to compete with some of the other countries like uh, uh, Bangladesh, uh, even Vietnam for that matter now has a duty free agreement with uh, Europe. So that that's going to be a tough uh, place to play. So for us to play in that space, obviously we have to go up in the value chain. We have to uh, uh, look at more value-added products to be brought in, which will uh, bring uh, the industry to stay closer to the customer, uh, particularly the European customer you're talking about here, and ensure that there is uh, continuity in terms of the business, but maybe not at the lower scale of, uh, of product and the uh, operation, but it will be more like up, upper end of the products and higher end of the value chain. So, um, look, short term we need to secure, uh, long, medium to long term we have to prepare and transform ourselves to be competitive uh, without the duty benefits. Okay. Uh, Hasida, earlier on you mentioned about FTS. <clears throat> um, uh, two questions. One is, have we really utilized the Indo Lanka FTA to, uh, to serve India as a which has a fairly rich market uh, with similar uh, 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 other one is uh, china is pushing for an fta with sri lanka uh, do you see opportunity in serving chinese market these two big markets uh, wealthy markets uh, uh, i mean or you feel that sri lanka will have to rely on these uh, us and europe as as mainstays in the next 10 years 
I think, uh, Nista, for the, if you look at the next uh, three to five years, I think the dominant uh, play will continue with the uh, US and Europe. And even then, uh, we have to start building uh, into the Asian markets. But there is no doubt that the Asian markets are becoming more and more important. And, and the per capita income is going up. The growing middle class is having more purchasing power. So there is no debate and doubt about uh, the fact that we have to in increase our exposure into the Indian and the Chinese market in particular. And then to the Asian market in general, right? So that's that's uh, absolutely crucial. So that I think is something that as an industry uh, and as a company, we are working closely to see how we need to get there. That's number one, right? Number two, we're getting into the FTAs. I think in, in order to get there, the two FTAs will be absolutely crucial. And what we have today, Mr. with the Indo-Sri Lanka FTA, I think there's a very clear limitation because uh, we can only do up to about 8 million pieces and there are certain criteria per annum that you can do. And we are fully exhausted with that. I mean, we have completely used uh, that FDA quota and in fact, there is a queue to get into that uh, number and even increase. So our uh, request has been right through in the negotiations to increase that number to a meaningful level because if you look at Bangladesh to India, Bangladesh virtually has a complete uh, uh, tax-free uh, FDA to India which I think they are now this year going to be a close to a billion dollars, I was told, right? And, and they're planning to go to two billion in the next uh, two to three years. So uh, with that kind of uh, benefit from Bangladesh to India, uh, Sri Lanka will naturally need uh, something, if not similar, at least uh, uh, the, the duty to be matched, uh, uh, duty benefit to be matched to those levels uh, with, with a larger meaningful quantity. And if that comes in, definitely the Indian domestic market is a market that we are working today and it will it'll have much more potential to grow. Uh, that said, the China itself is also a, a manufacturer on its own in a big way. Uh, so they, they have their own supply from Vietnam and China to the uh, Chinese uh, domestic market and it won't be an easy place to enter and, and sort of uh, position ourselves as a Sri Lankan uh, uh, Sri Lanka as exporter to China, but but that's something that we need to do with together with some of our um, uh, brands who are also eagerly keen to get into these strong two markets and establish themselves. Uh, so I think in that context, uh, the, having the duty free agreement will be very useful. Uh, and I think we have made representations together with the government previously when the negotiations were actively happening. And I think it's something that we need to keep pushing to a closure and preferably with uh, with uh, the benefits uh, which are which we probably need to be similar to what the other uh, similar countries are getting. And my uh, view there is, I think there are some brands uh, like Uniqlo, for example, is a, is a brand which is big in Asia. Uh, that's probably the number one retailer for in, in Asia when it comes to the uh, clothing industry. Uh, so that's a, that's a type of uh, a brand who can take us as a country, as a, a company to there. So likewise, we need to pick and choose a few of the brands who are big in the Chinese market and start working on them. And at the moment, uh, the, the, the FTA duty free benefits come in, I think the value proposition and the cost competitiveness becomes uh, much stronger and the case to work together becomes very powerful. So I think that's a very important uh, aspect to diversify our markets from best and have uh, more exposure in the next maybe uh, three to five years and going up to 10 years thereafter in a meaningful scale to the Asian market. Just one question on these markets. Uh, 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 we have seen some Sri Lankan companies setting up closer to in Africa and other the uh, Caribbean in terms of uh, benefiting from their trade deals with US uh, and all. I mean, will that shift continue or has it sort of now you know, people have, you don't see many people following, uh, uh, you know, is it advantageous to relocate some of your production there? I mean, I know uh, Africa is a favorite spot. Uh, I'm sure Bangladesh, some of the exports, I think you also benefiting. Uh, what's the scope in terms of relocation? So uh, it all starts with the brand strategy because our customers generally have a buying uh, strategy where they look at geographically uh, spreading the risk on one side and on the other side having cost competitiveness and advantages particularly looking at the duty free benefits so as you know africa has uh, most of the african countries have uh, uh, direct access to both us and the european market duty free and even with raw material not being produced within the african region you can 
bring raw material from anywhere in the world and do only the sewing operation in Africa and then export back. So that's a huge advantage and the cost uh, competitiveness, etc. becomes uh, critical. So the, some of the brands in particular have been pushing uh, um, uh, all of us to uh, set up uh, in, in, uh, in African location and maybe in the Caribbean locations as well in, in Central America, etc. Uh, so that's more called the nearshoring concept, which uh, takes uh, your manufacturing closer to the American US market. Uh, so uh, the, the, the near nearshoring concept to the Central America and the more duty duty free uh, benefits to be enjoyed through the African relocation. So these are strategies that the brands uh, have, and if you, you as a, a supplier uh, don't uh, marry with those uh, strategies, so the brands you'll be out of them, right? Somebody else will surely be picked up and given. So my view there is Nesta, that uh, it's good Sri Lankan companies are looking overseas uh, and, and uh, retaining that business uh, within the Sri Lankan company and ideally the, the entrepreneur trade I mentioned to you before is the way to go because Sri Lankan company can take the order, uh, we can do all the front end activities from Sri Lanka where the white collar jobs will remain and use these duty free locations as subcontract manufacturing destinations uh, and then obviously you have a win-win situation on one side you're happy with the, the your customer is happy which is the most important thing on one side and on the other side you're uh, contributing to the country Sri Lanka's economy on the other side and then uh, of course you're being competitive because you're offering the solution from either a location as well so rather than losing that business from the country to a completely another outside vendor right rather than outside supplier it is advantageous for Sri Lankan companies to um, uh, relocate some of the manufacturing to these destinations and and retain, I must reiterate, retain the front end activities in Sri Lanka and give that value addition in Sri Lanka, which is I'm a real, uh, uh, you know, advocate of that concept uh, because that, that's that's the way forward. We have to have those white collar jobs and we have that skill in the country. So we have more to harness through that. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Hasita. I want you to do me a favor and, and, and also uh, respond to the audience. I want you to wear your financial hat. And, and expertise on tax matters. Please, there are some questions which are related to, uh, only you can answer some of these questions. I wanted to read through the questions on tax and uh, uh, income tax related matters. And just please do respond when, I, when, 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 when there is some uh, opportunity. Uh, I'd like to move on to uh, Shiromal. Uh, quickly, in terms of, uh, I know it's bad time to do marketing because everyone is so preoccupied with COVID, but we always have this issue about destination marketing. Uh, we haven't got it right. Uh, maybe we need to go start marketing uh, now if you are looking at a revival in 2022. Uh, how how progressive have uh, has we been in terms of uh, that challenge? And any, any recommendations uh, from your perspective, how we can do it much better? Because we know even during COVID, there are certain destinations which are still doing well. Maldives, yeah. for example, because it's unique, but uh, we also need to sort of get back into that global messaging platform. Yeah, so as you said, we start for the last almost seven years, we have not had any country promotion or you know destination marketing. Uh, we don't have an advertising agency. We don't have a PR agency. And as you know, uh, you need to react very fast to different uh, because tourism is a very volatile or rather vulnerable industry to various uh, things that are happening around us. So we need to react fast. And to do that, we need to have a country positioning. We need to. So none of these things sadly has happened in the last couple of years. We are being more reactive than proactive. Uh, so whenever something happens, we jump to it. So I would think we do need to have a proper destination marketing program. We need to understand where we want to position our country. Is it a high end? Is it the budget traveler? Is it somewhere in between? So we, we once we have that idea, then we can do a right proper brief and then get, get a proper advertising agency and a PR agency and market the destination, which is, which is very vital. As you said, uh, I mean, it's much easier for the Maldives but they also have different uh, levels of hotels now. But, uh, but so, and then we, we need to know our niche and we need to try and market so that just because you market it as a high-end destination, for instance, it doesn't mean you're not going to get any budget travelers. So, but whereas it would be difficult if we advertise or market it as a budget destination, 
then getting a high-end traveler will be a little more difficult, obviously. So I think we also as industry must understand this. And rather than doing tactical offers all the time, we must have a proper plan program and do a proper destination marketing campaign. So that is that is the and and unfortunately we do have the money. We've been every year we've been returning this money to the treasury rather than using the money, uh, so which is which is really sad. Uh, so there is a lot of promotional activities that can be done. Even right now, Sri Lankan Airlines, as I said, have come forward and they're doing a one one on one one for one promotion. Uh, so uh, the private sector is also willing to uh, partner and and do these things, but unfortunately, it hasn't happened. But it's vital. It is very very important that we do that. But I think the cabinet has approved money for uh, marketing promotion, and I hope that's going to really take place soon. But we have another burning issue with regards to procurement uh, process. So because we have to adhere to the naturally the government procurement. And that unfortunately isn't uh, isn't compatible with the requirements of the tourism industry. So if, uh, sometimes it takes about nine months for that entire process to take place. So by that time, whatever the incident that happened has, has you know blown out. You know if, if it, whatever it is. So I think we need to understand the need of the industry and maybe amend, modify, do whatever that needs to be done. So that we can react faster to the needs uh, of the industry. Okay, thank you. Uh, a discussion on tourism is incomplete without this issue. There is little, uh, you know, we're trying to open up to India uh, with buy one, get one free. Uh, of course, we're trying to uh, open up for uh, Russia, Ukraine. Of course, there is this new fresh concern about tourism and COVID. Um, uh, how, uh, there's huge debate uh, in social media as well. Uh, from an industry perspective, uh, how would you respond? Uh, I mean, should we just keep closing the doors or are we doing right? Or do we need to, how do we need to get it right? So I think uh, the tourists, the, the development authority has set out along with, uh, with the health authorities, very strict guidelines. And I think the the people, public also must understand that the people who are involved in the tourism sector are responsible and they will not want to put the public health at risk because we, we are also people living in the community. We also have uh, you know family, friends and everybody else. So we wouldn't do anything to jeopardize the health of the, of the people. We do understand the country infrastructure in health is not that great. Uh, we, we have, uh, you know, they get stressed to the maximum if they were stressed very recently. So we would not do anything to jeopardize it. So, or everybody, whether it is a tuk tuk driver or whether it is somebody in a five star hotel, they will follow the guidelines given very strictly. I mean, if you look around, you might see traveler, tourist guides, chauffeur guides in those PPE kits. It's very inconvenient for them, but they are not grumbling because they, they are using it. So, uh, so that those there, there are certain uh, guidelines given and we are following those restrictions and we, we have carried out and it's not just the Indians and the Russians that are coming, Mr. There are people from Europe traveling. There are some European countries that have uh, sort of their restrictions have been lifted and maybe so there, so there are people coming. I mean, even right, I think last month we had about almost 5,000 tourists coming. Of course, some of them come for quarantine, but there are genuine tourists coming. I mean, our company has handled, lots of other companies have handled. So uh, it is happening. It, so I think we must understand that uh, tourist uh, industry is not just doing it for greed. I think the country also requires foreign exchange right now. That is a vital uh, component of the economy. So we we can also contribute. You know, it's about four and a half billion dollars uh, was lost to the country. So we can try now build build little by little and start contributing. Plus, there is about three million people, uh, about three four hundred, about five hundred thousand direct and three million indirectly that are affected by uh, tourists not coming in. So we, 
that they also become a burden on the economy, on the country then. So getting our feedback and getting the tourists coming is vital. I think uh, it, it, it's, it's almost, uh, I mean, it has to be done. Uh, so the since the guidelines have been given and KPMG has audited uh, and you know all that has been done and now I think all I can ask is to ask the public please do not be judgmental uh, tourists I mean even if we have a Sri Lankan coming traveling overseas and coming back they have the same risk of bringing the virus back to the country uh, so it's it's the same risk. If, if, if I travel overseas and I come back, I can bring the, the virus. So it, it's the same thing. Of course, the numbers could be more and certain countries are having less uh, vaccinated people. So maybe we need to be a little cautious. We need to, I mean, there are, there are areas I, I do agree, but if, if uh, we are coming, if the tourist is coming from a country with maybe 60, 70% vaccination, I don't think we need to worry because we are also vaccinated then, hopefully by next month. And our vaccination program is going so well. And we're very thankful. I think that is the key for tourism to start. The vaccination program will really help us uh, position the country as a, as a you know, vaccinated, fully vaccinated, almost fully vaccinated country. And uh, we can encourage people to come in and public should... Uh, accept that the people in the tourism industry will act responsibly and ensure that uh, you know everybody is protected we are also keen about our own staff you know they are up there just like the nurses and the doctors if, if, if a tourist shop guide goes to meet a client then they are also exposed to the same thing so we wouldn't want to do that so it, it is as i said or whether whether they go to a hotel and then so it's a server serving. It's the same uh, risk. So it's not that people are greedy for money. It's just that it is a, a vital thing right now for the country and for the yeah, industry. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Shiroma. Uh, very passionately addressing the challenge. Excellent. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> That's the only uh, way I know, Nista. <laughs> That's true. Uh, uh, Professor, uh, whatever, I'll move on to the few questions for you. Uh, one is about with this uh, post, uh, because of the COVID, there is so much of reliance on online. Uh, the question is um, uh, conversion. Will there be a full conversion of primary and secondary education to online method? That's number one. And then also uh, in the recent case about, you know, uh, uh, demand by teachers for higher wages, uh, do you justify it, um, particularly in the current situation? And then also going forward, uh, online education is likely to uh, get more traction even once schools are reopened. But I mean, uh, how, how two, two twin issues about uh, paying more Salary, uh, higher salaries for teachers as well as online, the challenge of online education. Yeah, Anissa, thank you. Uh, one of the things that we need to look at now, I was talking on education. Education is a lifelong process, you know. So we need to do some retraining. You see, uh, the retraining of all the government servants has to be urgently carried out. One is on the uh, digital area, you know, because uh, without that, I don't know whether they can really perform what they are doing, you know. So, and also that all government departments will go digital and that will help the, the society so that they don't have to come to government offices, maybe from their uh, homes or maybe if they have centers in the villages. From there, they can do all their work. So, uh, government has to really read, uh, look at this because uh, everyone thinks that uh, after they get a, a degree or professional qualification that they can carry on because in the professional education, they have to uh, compulsorily uh, do uh, the con continuing professional education. So similarly, uh, government has a major task in this because uh, they have to bring the teachers to a very, very uh, high level where they can also teach the students the new things that are happening. You know, it's... Uh, the technology is one of the things because if they are going to operate that, how they are going to interact with the students, how they can do it. So I, I don't think that we can really go full uh, uh, online. It, it is uh, the best is to go for hybrid. Because if you go for hybrid, that means maybe certain classes 
uh, can be uh, where we have classes at uh, the school and then uh, quite a lot of work to be done online. Now, even to do that, uh, the government must ensure this connectivity, you know. Connectivity is of what, uh, uh, uppermost in uh, this whole thing, you know. So because in the budget, I think they must give incentives for people who go and put towers in all these areas, you know. If, I think uh, that would be the best way to incentivize them and tell that if uh, they put that up, then all the telecom operators should share that and then pay that. I was told that they are doing that. But in the budget, they must uh, mention that, you see, because that is something that the people are expecting. They give this uh, connectivity because uh, now that the COVID has really made it a very, very important uh, item, if we give that, then a lot of the problems uh, uh, can be sorted out, you know, because one thing is even the, the easiest way that you can take education to the people is uh, this connectivity. Now, of course, they are showing on the TV and doing it. But that is not enough. Now, they also have to have a monitoring system. Then they may have to have other methods by which the students can uh, look at it. So, uh, first thing I feel is that uh, all government sermons, whether uh, the teachers, everyone, then they will come into a new sort of uh, state of mind, you know, because uh, that's really what happened. Because I remember in 77, when the open economy was there, everyone said that uh, all the state institutions are closed down, the banks are going to close down. But the, the state, two state banks started, you know, they did the computerization. Today, they have been able to manage. They are now really, uh, you know, we are a different world. So I think if we do this, uh, we will be, then of course, on the salaries, now that's not a matter that I can really speak on. It's, it's up to the uh, government, you know, because uh, uh, normally in the private sector, they will pay the salaries according to their performance. So they will have to look at uh, it in that way and see whether the, the the service that they are rendering uh, to the uh, education sector and then uh, look at it. So uh, it's not a matter that I can really say uh, yes or no, but uh, if it is something that uh, has been given, maybe sometime, uh, maybe in, it was published in the Gazette or it has been uh, given by a committee, uh, they should have worked that out long time ago, you know, how they are going to do it because you either they should have given in installments or so their planning is very important you know that's why you know we are chartered provisional managers you know the main problem in this whole country is that there is no proper management so to get this management you need the education because you see now supposing if i become a mp and if i am told uh, to go and become the finance minister i should have the skills to do that you see now i have accounting background but that is really not uh, sufficient you know so the, you have to have know what is this government budgeting, how they are doing it. So this uh, knowledge has to be given to all the people who are there. Because I am telling this, because now in any government job, there is a, a method by how you can recruit a person. So then they have to meet those criteria. But the political parties are not having any criteria. But political parties must also fall in line because then they will be able to get the best people. Maybe they don't have to have uh, be graduates and... Uh, MBS and other things, but at least have a certificate program. They have a certificate program, diploma program, advanced diploma program in all these uh, areas because government is a very, very complex uh, 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 maybe uh, management involved, you know. So I think uh, if they do it, if the people pass the certificate level, they can go to the maybe the ground level, maybe the village level or whatever it is. Then if they do the diploma, maybe a municipal council, if they pass the advanced diploma, they can be taken to the uh, to the parliamentary level. So uh, political parties also have to keep this in mind. Because everyone thinks that uh, although now we do a 12-year or 13-year education, everything is going properly you now. According to the UCT exam, then on merit you are done. But after that, then the whole process changes, you know, that is to get into edu uh, the university, there is time lag, all those, so all those have to be corrected. Then also on merit, uh, they should uh, do the selection. That is the best way that the country can uh, come forward, you know. So if they want to do that, uh, I think there won't be any blame, you know, because if, if a supporter comes and you, later you have to sack him, he will score. But supposing you take him on merit, then there is no problem, you know. And then you can answer to the public to say that I have taken him on the merit and experiences he has got. So uh, uh, this is a major thing that is there. But education is connected with this and the continuing professional development, because anyone... Uh, who goes in does not mean that he is uh, finishing his career there. 
he has to learn more things in order to improve himself and also to play a major role and uh, uh, discharge his duties to the society. Thank you. Uh, uh, lots of questions. Uh, uh, I'll try to see how much we can squeeze it. Uh, I'll come back to you, uh, Professor. Hasita, yeah. there are two questions I wanted to take. Uh, one is the question about uh, the immediate conversion of export proceeds. Uh, there is a uh, rumor going that maybe from 25%, they'll increase it to 50% or more given the current situation. And also a question which I think you, you are best uh, uh, suited to answer is given the uh, fiscal challenges, uh, you know, how, uh, and the foreign crisis, foreign exchange crisis, how comfortable or how difficult uh, government would be in terms of coming up with a more development or a progressive budget. Uh, first question is on the conversion. Should it be on a case by case depending on the imported inputs? Uh, and would the industry, can the exporters stomach an increase in the conversion, given that there is a cap on the rate now at 203? And the other one is about how challenging it will be for the government to come up with a more progressive budget given the fiscal challenges. Yeah, the first one, I think uh, the 25%, uh, first thing is, uh, I think the government uh, at Central Bank is still working on to uh, get the 25% conversion to happen in a seamless manner because some of the uh, areas are being fully covered and they are fully compliant and that's being tracked but some areas uh, I think there is a concern on how to track the details and, and uh, ensure that even the 25% is uh, being uh, converted so that's the first thing for which uh, I was told that uh, there'll be a new uh, uh, revenue uh, collection account that will be introduced very soon as legislation so that all exporters will have to bring their money to that particular account uh, in, in, in any bank uh, or multiple accounts in multiple banks uh, uh, it, may, it will be allowed and then based on that they will uh, uh, there'll be a better monitoring system to ensure that the 25 percent will be converted so that's the first thing uh, because if that happens uh, there will be a i was told a much higher conversion amount uh, based on the broader statistics of exporters Sports. The second uh, uh, thing I uh, about the 25 percent, they go to 50 percent or not, they need to be looked at thereafter. And I think it has to be looked at in in proper um, the cost structure basis because you need to look at where that money is going and how what in what currency are they spending back. For example, in a barrel industry, the raw material cost is about 60 percent, uh, uh, and there are other uh, expenses in dollar terms that go in. So that that, that uh, to meet that amount, obviously there is uh, some amount of uh, uh, the percentage of the dollar proceeds have to be retained to pay in dollars. So that's the uh, uh, logic that uh, that has uh, brought in, in this 25% uh, uh, conversion level. Uh, but that said, there are maybe certain other industries which may not need because there might not be uh, imported uh, amounts or dollar denominated payments uh, of, of, to that extent uh, going out in other industries. So that might be an area to look at, which I'm, I'm not uh, fully aware of the details of how the authorities are looking at it, but I'm sure uh, that there will be uh, further uh, scrutiny into this area and deep dive into this area given the current challenges in uh, getting the dollars out. So that's the first question. Uh, the second question, I think, uh, yes, it's a very challenging time. I think probably uh, uh, a time which we have never seen in our uh, lifetime in the past. We've had uh, tsunamis, we've had uh, 30 years of war, we had so many other different aspects that hit us uh, in different forms uh, to this economy. But I think this uh, time uh, leading to the budget, there'll be uh, a very significant uh, uh, challenge in the hand, especially because uh, the revenue, uh, uh, tax revenue as a percentage of GDP has dropped to uh, levels uh, that have never it, it have fallen never before. Uh, so in that context, I think there will there has to be some drive to increase the revenue uh, as a percentage of uh, GDP, uh, and and for that measures the government will have to take some uh, steps to push that up at first place. And obviously certain expenses uh, like the, the the public sector salaries, the interest payments, etc., are virtually uh, you know you can't do much about it because they are coming out inherited, and in the short term those need to be expensed anyway. So in that uh, when you look at it that way, the recurring expenses. Uh, uh, while certain areas uh, in the state's expenditure need can be brought down, the main salary related expense, uh, which is a bigger bucket, uh, is, a, is a tough one to reduce uh, overnight. 
So in that context, I think the next thing that uh, look at is uh, the public investment is the balance of money after the recurrent uh, expenditure goes into the public investment. So public investment side, there will be a lot of challenges to allocate funds because uh, revenue uh, piece will not fund uh, much of it. And then if you're going to uh, do it through borrowings, even the foreign borrowings are very limited at the moment, given the current uh, country rating situation, uh, as well as the existing uh, repayment of debt, we need a lot to refinance as well. Uh, in the dollar denominated debt so in that context i think uh, the, the challenge will be to allocate out of the rupee borrowings uh, to fund the public sector uh, investment but i think it's important that government prioritizes i'm sure they will do that uh, because where the money should go has to still be uh, pumped in to keep the public investment going because if you don't invest we know even in a business if you don't invest there won't be growth right uh, so if you want future growth in the country we will have to make those public investments those uh, development oriented investments have to come in so there has to be a compromise between the recurring expenses and the uh, public investment that go in and in the investment piece i think it's very important that government look at uh, prioritizing and looking at where the short term uh, benefits as well as the medium to long term benefits are most uh, and based on that uh, the prioritization should be done in allocating uh, cash because cash will be absolutely limited in this budget Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Rizvi, I'm coming up with uh, lots of questions. I would advise you to, uh, from CPM, maybe uh, uh, get the addresses of or email address of the participants and respond to the specific questions on fertilizer. Maybe you can even do a session on fertilizer. I know we had so much, but I, I'll pick one question. Uh, uh, recently, government also sort of expanded uh, milk production initiatives by inviting uh, private uh, PPP related uh, projects. Um, the question is, do we, uh, that was more to do with uh, improving our self-sufficiency. Here the question is whether there will be scope for exporting milk products. Do you see any scope for that? Actually, milk products uh, is something that Sri Lanka has a huge demand locally because of the fact that we import uh, yes. ordered significant volumes. But uh, the many efforts were made to improve local milk production. So before we go to exports, I think there is quite a scope for improving local production of milk. And there's a lot of work that can be done across various models. One was one model was importing uh, the high yielding uh, heifers or the milking cows from Australia. And there was a start made, uh, came to the NADDB. There were a lot of issues with that. But also if you look at uh, even Sri Lankan models, if you look at India, there's some success stories uh, with the Amul, Amul cooperatives. And also in Sri Lanka, we have only about 15% of the, the people involved in crop and, and dairy together, which you know, they have 10, 20 herd of cattle, maybe they can go up to 50, 100 herd to increase that number. So if that number can be promoted by some incentives uh, with some specific focus, even in the budget to increase or double the number of uh, Sri Lankans involved in crop as well as uh, animal husbandry, that is, they have cattle as well as land. So that needs to be upped. And uh, uh, I think once we get there, I think it's simply uh, the surpluses that come out of the milk production. Definitely, there is a value addition heritage that's already started in Sri Lanka with the yogurts and other types of value added milk products, the cheeses, the paneer, etc., with Kotmale and the others doing quite a good job. But uh, we still have to get the production base up. So unless there is somebody who has got a niche market and who has got the cost of production, the milk right, uh, I don't see much scope for exporting surpluses. The, the potential lies in getting the milk production locally up. And for even right now, even with the supermarkets, they have a problem getting adequate uh, milk supplies, uh, fresh milk supplies. Of course, there's the tetra packaging and all of that. So uh, there has to be a focus on increasing milk production and I'm sure the budget will come up with some incentives to help boost milk production, local milk production in some form and I think some incentives are on the way as well. So that's with regard to milk and outputs. With regard to the other questions that you brought up, uh, Nishta, very, very importantly on the fertilizer thing, that's going to be a big, uh, big issue that's going to be, uh, that needs to be resolved and uh, there can be long, several approaches. There also is a case for promoting uh, localized organic fertilizers. There's a lot of activity that's going on using ash, various other organic medium 
but it has to be localized based on uh, district wise. Uh, it's a very complicated subject where the soil conditions, uh, soil testing has to be done, in some instances, soil remediation. But uh, the short term, you can't do it. You need this at least the 50% of the fertilizer, otherwise, we're going to get heavily impaired. And I think it's the, the task of everybody involved in the industry, as well as those who know the economics of the fallout of this. Uh, to, to push for this at least the 50%. I don't think there's a problem about black marketeering and issues arising from uh, restricting the normal laws of demand and supply might or apply because when there's a shortage, there's going to be a gap available. Now, for example, even the Department of Agriculture, some of the scientists are, are promoting a healthy mix of organic uh, inputs, fertilizers. So you two applications of organic and two applications of chemical fertilizer. And you can get the same results, if not better yields, by also saving the environment, uh, ensuring there's no toxins and residues, avoiding overuse, and significantly reducing the import bill. And most importantly, to ensure that we have enough food to eat at the end of the day. Otherwise, we are headed, even with the foreign exchange crisis, if we head, if we head towards the food crisis, already we are seeing the signs of some of that happening. And this is not a good precursor. If we say sugar, the rationing, the price controls, all of these are directly linked in some form or the other to the signals with regard to outputs locally. So that relates back again to fertilizer subsidies. It's a pity that uh, the people who make the decisions uh, have not had sufficient engagement. So what we also recommend the minister from industry is with the next round, please do consult the industry, please do consult the scientists and then take some very enlightened decisions. Those are my comments and I certainly are open to responding to all the other questions. I'll ask uh, CPM to forward me the questions. Maybe I'll try as far as possible to respond to them. Yeah, excellent. Thank you very much. Uh, we have almost reached uh, the allocated time for the panel discussion. So I'd like to hand over to, uh, uh, in terms of, uh, uh, to uh, wrap up the session to Hashan. But uh, before that, uh, I'd like to thank all the panelists for their time and uh, very frank views uh, in terms of uh, uh, original thoughts in, in, in for the wish list, as well as responses to the questions from the audience, and also the audience being making it very interactive. Uh, lots of questions unanswered, but we have a limited time, and hence a request to CPM to really uh, personally channel those questions to the panelists, and then maybe get some response. So thank you very much, everybody, and uh, over to Hashan. Right. Um... It's a very fruitful two hours, uh, Nista. Uh, it is indeed a very fruitful forum um, with tons of knowledge pouring in. We have five strong sector professionals making headways to the wish list. Uh, speakers, thank you very much once again on behalf of CPM, uh, Suresh, uh, Shiromal, uh, Professor Hasita, and Rizvi for that fantastic uh, commitment. Also, the evergreen Nista as the elite moderator handling uh, most of the audience, uh, most of the audience views. Uh, indeed, it's a, a super job. Also, viewers, this is for you. I know um, some people are there. Um, this is just a piece of uh, those gigantic events. And I encourage you all to take the CPM membership to be a part of Sri Lanka's um, biggest knowledge sharing events and, and knowledge sharing hub. Um, also, you can consume CPM certificate diploma and the advanced diploma in entrepreneurial study segment to be a practical or practitioner in entrepreneurship. I think Professor Adid touched upon um, the education sector and we encourage you to come and, and see what, uh, how his thoughts and his ideas being put to practice at uh, CPM. So call us and be at your service. With that, we come to the conclusion of this great forum. Recover